We all have experiences and stories with fire. Some of us, we got experiences, and some of our best memories have come around the campfire. Some of us, oh yeah, the QR code, you can scan that. Everyone's like putting their phones up. Some of us, we, sorry, I'm a youth pastor, so I get like ADHD and just get distracted, but it's all good. So anyway, some of us, we've got campfire experiences, and those are some of our best memories, whether it's the songs, the stories, roasting some s'mores and marshmallows around the campfire. It's just a good time, and we love the campfire. Some of you are some grill masters in here, and you just love staring at a piece of meat for uh, like crazy hours at a time, and the fire, and the Traegers, and the smokers, and barbecue, barbecuers. God bless you guys. The world needs you in, in it, because we all know that what comes off of the Traeger and the barbecue is a good thing, and so praise God for that. And then this last week, a lot of us got to celebrate 4th of July, and we all lit our courts and streets on fire with fireworks, and it was just a blast and a good time. And so wherever you are, many of us have an experience or a story regarding fire. Me, I tend to have stories with fire where fire shouldn't be there, um, to say the least. They're in places and spaces that probably shouldn't have fire, and the, the fact that there is fire is problematic. And so um, part of my nightly routine, I'll give you an example. Part of my nightly routine is my wife goes to bed, I say goodnight. She's an early bird, so goes to bed super early. I'm a night owl. I love staying up late. No one can bother me at nighttime. Everyone's sleeping, and so it's perfect. And so I go to bed or go into my office after saying goodnight to my wife, play some video games just to wind down. It's one of my hobbies. I just enjoy it. Um, after a while, around midnight, one o'clock, I'll go to the kitchen, get myself a midnight snack. Come on, somebody. And then we get ourselves going back into the office to do some study, spend time with God and his word, and just finish my day in that setting. And so me and my wife, we had been married about three months at this point, and we're in our, our new apartment together, still figuring things out a little bit. And this apartment was a little bit older and out of date. Not like out of date where there's like an open flame fire to cook things, um, but like a, a stove top that had the burner externally, not like the flat top ones that are nice and easy to clean. One of the ones with the burner is external and there's the like cup underneath it to catch like spills and crumbs to make it easier to clean. No one showed me how to do that until we left um, and it was my mom that showed me. And so anyway, I got this burner and here we go. It's 1 a.m. in the morning. We're married three, three months at this point and I get to midnight snack time. And so I make my way to the kitchen. I start throwing down some cheese quesadillas. Any cheese quesadilla witnesses in here? Come on, we love it. And so simple, easy. I'm like young 20s. It's the only thing I know how to cook at this point. Um, I've eaten this a thousand times, made it a thousand times in college. And so I'm a master at quesadillas. Like it, it doesn't go wrong with me until this point in my life. Normally when I'm cooking quesadillas, it's not a uncommon occurrence where there's like a little bead of smoke that'll come up from underneath the pan from a crumb that ended up in that little catch pan thing. This time, there was just more smoke than normal. And so uh, I didn't think anything of it at first. I'm like, oh, maybe it'll die down. But the smoke just kept on coming, just more and more smoke. And so I'm like, what is going on? So I did what any sensible person would do. I picked up the pan from the burner that was on high. It's the only thing that I know how to cook on is high. And so I picked up the pan, I looked, and there's a fire. And friends, it's not just like a little match fire that's like, oh, that's cute, birthday candle, I could just blow that out. No, this fire is the size of a tennis ball sitting underneath this burner. And I don't know what's going on. I don't know why that's there. It's an electric stovetop. And so why is there an open flame on my electric stovetop? And so what is going on? I start freaking out because my mind is running all over the place. It's one in the morning. My wife's asleep. I'm about to burn the apartment down and in doing so become that neighbor that's going to wake up everybody with the fire department and the fire alarms. I'm about to burn the whole wing of the apartment down. It's going to be a mess. And so I'm freaking out. I don't know what to do. And you know how fire like makes people act weird. I'm weird around fire. I don't know what to do with it. And so I start freaking out. Fire's going. It's like kind of growing, but I don't know what to do with it. I didn't have a fire extinguisher at that point. And so I did what any reasonable husband would do. I went and told my wife that there's a fire in the apartment <laughs> because she would want to know. And so I run into the room and I'd bust down the door. I go, 
babe, there's a fire. We got to get out of here. And she's so cute. And in the night when she's tired, she goes, huh? And just like totally out of it. And man, just like zombie-esque and beautiful. But anyway, she wake, get, wakes up and I told her, there's a fire. We got to go. And so I run back to the kitchen. Now my fire is not just the size of a tennis ball. It is the size of the burner itself. And it's not one of the small burners, nice and cute like. No, it's one of the big burners. And so this fire has just grown on me. And I'm like, what is happening in my apartment? And so all of a sudden this fire keeps growing and I start freaking out and resort back to my highest level of fire safety training. And so I tried to smother it. I thought, man, if I just put something over it to get this fire to go out, it'll, turn, it'll put it out. The burner was still on high. And so I grabbed a, a kitchen, <laughs> kitchen rag. I tossed it over the burner and the towel started on fire now. So now it's not just a size of a tennis ball fire. It's not just the size of the burner fire. It is the size of a kitchen towel fire in my kitchen. It's about two feet tall off the stove. And now I'm really freaking out. And I don't know what to do because like, you know, fire, like if you can't put it out, it just starts messing with your brain. And so my brain is fried. And here comes my wife. She walks in. She's like, what do you mean there's a fire? Like rubbing her eyes and all that. And she looks at me, looks at the fire and goes, oh, looks at me, shakes her head. Just turns the burner off, gets a wet towel, puts it over, and that was it. The fire was gone. <laughs> so praise God for my wife and her levels of fire safety. Um, but there's two things that we learned from this. One, well, I didn't get to enjoy my quesadilla. That thing was charred um, to a crisp. But also, I now know how to deal with an open fire on my electric stovetops in case it ever happens again. And so praise God for that. But for many of us, we've got all these stories. And the problem with this fire in my kitchen wasn't that uh, I would nearly burnt the apartment down. It wasn't even that I didn't get to enjoy my quesadilla. The problem was that it was a fire in a place that I wasn't expecting it to be. It was a fire that I also didn't authorize to be there on my electric stovetop. If I wanted an open flame, I'd have got one. And so anyway, that's all that's wrong with it. But we find a story in the primary text we're going to live in today in Leviticus 10, where we see two men start up an unauthorized fire before the Lord. But before we get into that text, I want to give us some context for where we've been so like in Leviticus leading up to this point so that we're caught up to speed. And so a few chapters earlier in the early chapters, we get all the context from um, about what types of rituals and sacrifices and things that the Israelites are supposed to follow um, regarding the altar. And so we learn of a number of things. There's uh, five main ritual sacrifices that Israel was to perform. Two of them, grain and fellowship, were ways for the Israelites to say thank you to God by offering back symbolic tokens of what God had first given them to give God praise and, you know, the happy, joyful stuff. These are the good types of sacrifices. The other other three, burnt, purification, and restitution, were ways of saying sorry to God. And in these sacrifices, the Israelites were making, making these sacrifices to come before God and say, God, I understand that my sin has created more evil in the world, more chaos, more death, and that was never the plan. And so, God, I'm sorry. And that's the purpose of these types of sacrifices. And it was usually done by offering up an animal with their blood in, the, in their body, put it on the altar, and let the animal atone for the person's sin. And so that's context for what we're working with here. In ver chapters 8 and 9, Moses gets a word from the Lord that he's to take his brother Aaron and his sons and ordain them as priests. And so 8 and 9, they go through the process of ordination, do all the study and all, this, all that. And basically we find ourselves end of chapter 9, right at the end of Aaron performing his first ritual sacrifice uh, in Leviticus. And so he performs the sacrifice, the ritual, all that. And here's what it tells us that happened at the very end of chapter 9 and verse 23. The glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. And so we see this crazy consuming fire come out. <clears throat> And, all, and consumes all that was on the altar. 
And now here comes Nadab and Abihu. Nadab and Abihu are Aaron's sons. And give these guys some grace. They've been on the job for like a day, okay? And so we're going to see what they start up in chapter 10, verse 1. Here's what happens. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will be proved holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. And Aaron remained silent. Verse 4. Moses summoned Mishael and Elzaphon, sons of Aaron's uncle Uziel, and said to them, Come here, carry your cousins outside the camp, away from the front of the sanctuary. So they came and carried them, and they're still in their tunics, outside of the camp, as Moses ordered. Then Moses said to Aaron and his sons Eleazar and Ithamar, Do not let your hair become unkempt, and do not tear your clothes, or you will die, and the Lord will be angry with the whole community." But your relatives, all the Israelites, may mourn for those the Lord has destroyed by fire. Do not leave the entrance to the tent of meeting, or you will die, because the Lord's anointing oil is on you. And so they did as Moses said. And now there's so much that's packed into these seven verses. There's so much that we can pull out of this. And there's one main thread. There's something so important from this that we're going to just kind of draw out throughout uh, the rest of my time here with you guys. And we're just going to spend time reflecting and looking back on this passage and just see the principles in here that we can apply to our lives. But as I read this for the first time, I started wondering all the questions that I'm sure many of you would probably wonder. Why was the fire unauthorized? Did they use the wrong incense? Did they come at the wrong time? Why did they die over such a small fire? It seems like they were doing something for God. Why would God be mad about that and and kill them? At the end of the day, we can't be certain on the answers to most of these questions. But we can be certain that they knew the clear command concerning the altar. And from, that's from Exodus 30, verse 9. It says, you shall not author, offer unauthorized incense on it. And so through the ordination process that Nadab and Abihu would have gone through, they would know this command very, very clearly. Because it was like the primary, one of the primary roles of the priests at the time was to perform these, these rituals. And so he, they would know this command. But despite knowing the command, they swept it under the rug, did the thing anyway, and ultimately they paid for it with their life. We read in scripture that God is an all-consuming fire. And it speaks to his sovereignty It speaks to his omniscience and this description of God as an all-consuming fire. Ultimately, it gives us a perfect picture of just how holy God is. And this is found a couple places. Deuteronomy 4 tells us, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. In the case of Nadab and Abihu, we can see clearly that although they were ordained as priests and probably knew better than anyone in Israel just how holy God is, they put that to the side, got complacent, got lazy in their service, And they got this seemingly harmless and small fire in their sensors, in their fire pans. This thing that seemingly doesn't do anything crazy, like a little match fire, not like my tennis ball fire that I had on my stove that turned into something big. It seemed really small at first. And because of this seemingly harmless and small thing, they paid with their life. Church, how many times do we find ourselves in moments where we've got this sensor or this fire pan that we're burning incense in and we call it my life. And we walk around with all these little behaviors and little sins in them, whether it be our anger, our lust, our envy, our behaviors, our pride, our foul language, our sin that we just sweep under the rug. Or even scarier is we overlook God's commands, even though we may have been well-meaning. We're like, oh no, I know that, but I gotta do this. And it seems well-meaning, But either way, we fail to recognize in the moment that what we have in our sensor, what we have in our fire pan, this thing called my life that we just keep on burning can kill us. And it is dangerous. And yet we keep on playing with it anyway. God never authorized for us to 
run with sin in such a way, whether it be sin or something we think we're doing for God, we have to recognize that these things, these little behaviors, these little sins can kill us. That it's dangerous. Jesus has a whole lot to say about how we are to treat sin. And all the things that Jesus says, it's ultimately why the apostle Paul in Romans is able to tell us in, in chapter six, for the wages of sin is death. And so sin can equal death. And so we've got to pay attention to this thing. And this isn't a sermon all about sin and all that. This is, a, this is a sermon about God's holiness. But in understanding God's holiness, we also have to understand our sin and our behavior and our relationship to God. When we reflect back on the passage in Leviticus 10, we see Moses instructing Aaron and his other sons to abstain from mourning in the same way uh, of everyone else with the usual ways of messy hair and torn garments. Because they had been made holy and their clothing was also holy, they had to stay away from anything that was related to death or dead bodies. And it's because that these things were seen as impure, unclean. In the same way, those of us who put our faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior and allowing for his death on the cross to atone for our sins, we have been made to be holy and set apart. We are made to live in the world, but not of the world. We are made to set the example so that everyone in the world can see us, see the way that we love each other, see the way that we have reverence for our Lord and Savior and give glory to the Father without even knowing that we are a believer. That's the, the duty that we have. It's the whole reason why, like, the, the fact that they had to stay away from all things pertaining to death is the same thing for us. We've got to stay away from all things pertaining to death, and that thing is sin. We've got to run away from it. We've got to stay away from it. And so when we get into this little game of playing with fire in our sensors, playing with the small sins in our lives and treating them as if they aren't anything to be taken seriously, as the old adage goes, if you play with fire, you're going to get burned. Me and some of my friends when I was a junior higher, uh, about 13 years old, we were a bunch of pyromaniacs. And so we just loved fire. And um, again, I've, I'm weird around fire. I don't know what to do with it. And so this dates back way long ago. Me and some of my friends were 13 years old hanging out. We burnt everything. We, we burnt sticks, leaves, bugs, um, each other, food, whatever we could to, to play with fire. And so this one day we're all hanging out at my buddy Patrick's house and we found on the internet that we could make a bomb from a can of Axe body spray. And junior hires kind of do this still where they get Axe body spray and they put like the whole can all at once on them and you smell them from a mile away. Um, especially when I was in junior high, that was the case. And so we've got the cans of Axe body spray strapped onto our hips because we're ready to go. And so we get this thing going, we see we can make a bomb out of an Axe can. And so out to the backyard we go to light this thing on fire because why wouldn't we? And so we end up out in the backyard, we got this can of Axe body spray knock the cap off of it, and it starts just spraying the body spray out. And we lit it on fire. Big fire, loud, hot, really explosive looking. The can never actually exploded, so it wasn't really a bomb, um, but it smelled good at least. And so um, the guy that was holding it, I don't remember which friend it was, but he had the can. And once we lit it, he got spooked and he dropped it. And now we were on the side yard of Patrick's house and this can started pointing the fire towards the fence. The fence started burning, and so Patrick has a couple choices. He can save us from his house burning, and we could still be friends with Patrick, or he can let his fence and his house burn down, and we're never going to see Patrick again. And so, friends, I went back into the archives of all the drives that I could find, and I found this picture of Patrick with this fire because he actually tilted the can upside down in picking it up, being our Savior, and all of the fluid came out and set this thing ablaze. So check out Patrick with this fire. <laughs> And so Patrick has no eyebrows anymore. His hair is burnt back to here. And he's got no arm hair. He's got burns all over the place. And so the old adage came true. We were playing with fire and ultimately we got burned. Friends, I think that we never realize the seriousness of fire and just how dangerous it can be and just how quickly it can light up. We hadn't gotten burned by it before. And so we just kept on testing how far we can go with it testing the limits of how big can we get this fire to be? How much more can we do? And unfortunately, I think that we as humans have a tendency to treat sin in the same way. 
where we toe the line with sin. We, we see how close it, we can get to getting burned and then we back off. We didn't get burned, so we're good. And so then the next time we go a little bit further and we didn't get burned, so we back off and we're good. And then a little bit further and a little bit further and a little bit further until all of a sudden we've now got this thing in our lives that's just consuming us. It makes us feel guilt. It makes us feel shame. We don't, we don't feel worthy of approaching God in his holiness. We don't feel like we measure up to anything because this whole sin thing is consuming us and taking over our lives. And it started and took root in something that was seemingly so small that we were just playing with that we were just testing the waters with. We have got to realize uh, that if we play with fire, we're gonna get burned. If we play with sin, we're going to get burned. When we are dealing with a God who is characterized as an all-consuming fire, we cannot afford to treat sin as if there are small sins that can be swept under the rug. We have got to understand that all sin is dangerous, no matter what, and sin, only seems like a small and unimportant thing to us when we don't take God's holiness seriously. It seems trivial to us only when our view of God's holiness seems trite. If we think God's purity and goodness and holiness isn't a big deal, then of course we're not gonna see sin as a big deal either. If we don't have reverence for God, if we don't worship God, if we don't submit to the authority of the Father, then of course we're not gonna care about sin. Why would we? There's, there's no consequence for us there. But because we worship a God who is characterized as an all-consuming fire, because we worship a God who is all-sufficient, all-knowing, all-powerful, we have got to realize that God is holy and we are not. And because he is holy, because he is the all-consuming fire, we've got to treat sin as if it can kill us, as if it's dangerous, as if it is something to not be played with. God is an all-consuming fire who dwells in unapproachable light. There is no impurity in him whose eyes are too pure to look on evil. His holiness is unbearable to endure. And so when we see God is holy, we see that no sin is small. When we see God is holy, we become aware of the dangers that lie ahead. It's not just a matter of, oh, will I get burned? I can put ointment on and feel better after a couple days. No, when we view sin and we understand that God is holy, we understand that sin is a matter of life and death. And it always has been. Now, this doesn't mean that all sins are the same. There, there, is, are different, uh, there are some sins that are worse than others and carry greater consequences as we can read through Scripture. But the distinction between cer certain sins having different consequences shouldn't shrink any sins for us. It shouldn't make us view them as smaller and less dangerous. See, it isn't our sins that are small, but it's our estimation of God that's small. And so we've got to shift our minds to see that God is holy and so much greater, so much more powerful than anything we could imagine. And these sins are to be taken seriously. Nadab and Abihu's death is a foreshadowing of the fierce fire that, e that awaits even the slightest sinners. God is that holy and sin is that serious. We read in Matthew 25, a parable that Jesus gives in kind of speaking to the severity of sin. In this parable, he's sharing about the sheep and the goats and how he'll separate them, you know, right and left. But the goats in this story, they represent the people who have neglected God's commands, who have become complacent to them, who are not giving to the poor, not living as though their life has been transformed by the all-consuming fire, that living their life and not, not, not paying attention to the reality that Jesus calls us for something great. And if we're not paying attention, we can get burned. And so when we see this, he says to them, this is a scary thing that we see in how serious sin is. He says to the, to the goats in this story, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Friends, if we don't think that sin is a big deal, I urge you this morning to shift your perspective. I plead with you to 
shift, shift your mind and renew your mind as it tells us to do in Romans 12 to understand just how big a deal this is. But even more than that, get ourselves to a point where we recognize that God is purely holy, that he is the all-consuming fire who is greater than all the sins, that sin doesn't have the final say anymore, that the final say belongs to Jesus and his death and resurrection on the cross. And that's the hope that we can get ourselves into. And church, let's, not, let's also not mistake God withholding his consuming fire as him not caring about our sins. While we might not see punishment and repercussions in the same way that we saw in the Old Testament, specifically with Nadab and Abihu, like we don't go and sin like we say a little curse word for um, stubbing our toe and then God smites us. Like that doesn't happen. But let's not mistake his kindness and mercy and the reality that he withholds his consuming fire um, with him being comfortable with our sins, with us being comfortable with our sins, just because it's small and seemingly harmless. Romans 2 begs the question, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that, God, that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? God doesn't want you to become comfortable and complacent with sin. He wants you to repent. He wants you to look at sin and run the other direction because we know that he is so much greater. He is so much more loving. And with him rests the promise of eternal life. With sin rests the promise of death and eternal damnation. That's what we're working with here. We have to pay attention. God wants you to repent and his kindness and his mercy should lead us there. Because he is good, because he is just, because he is merciful. And I'm not saying that we need to be perfect and never sin again. That would be awesome um, if we could live that life. But I'm speaking today directly at the little things that we just sweep under the rug. The small sins in our lives that we've become apathetic towards. The things that we're willing to just let fl you know, fly, flow by the wind. Sin is no small thing. It's not a matter of big or small. It's not a matter of what our feelings are towards it. At the end of the day, we don't get to go to God and justify, him for, justify for him our sins. Like we can't go to God and, and just in prayer say like, God, today I went and lusted over someone who isn't my spouse, but it's actually better than um, acting on it and committing adultery. Like God's not gonna be sitting there being like, you know, you're right. Adultery would be much worse. <laughs> proud of you. No, like that's not how this works. Like we've, we've got to understand that Jesus came and he upped the ante when it comes to sin. He raised the bar in how we're supposed to respond to sin. Jesus tells us that if something is causing you to sin, to cut it off and get rid of it. And that it'd be better to live your life in eternity without an arm than to be thrown into the pits of hell. And so that's what Jesus does. And because he elevates that level, we also have to increase our view of God's holiness. We, ha we have to. And when we increase our view of God's holiness, it makes us take our sanctification more seriously. It makes us take the process by which we are becoming more and more like Jesus more seriously. My freshman year of high school, I, I played soccer all growing up, but freshman year of high school, I made the varsity soccer team. And I remember the feeling that I had around the team captain. His name was Clark. It's just such a captain name, isn't it? Captain Clark. And so Clark was just the guy. He had it all. He had, you know, the muscles. He was 6'2". He had good grades. He had the Superman curl. He could do whatever he wanted. And this guy was just the best soccer player I've ever played with on any level. Just worlds above the rest of us. And so Playing with him, it was like playing with a full grown-up in a game with a bunch of boys. He was that much better. He was the league MVP. He led the league in goal scored, led the league in assists, and he went All-American. And on top of that, I think he was the valedictorian or the salutatorian, whichever one. So dude was just different. He was just a different breed of a human being. But I remember the feeling that I had around him. I was like, oh man, Clark is so awesome. He's, he's just the best. He's got the Superman curl, so handsome. And so I remember walking into the first week of training and you know, I'm a freshman on varsity and so I'm arrogant. I'm feeling, feeling myself a little bit. I'm like, oh yeah, I can play with these guys. I'm a freshman on varsity, no big deal. Let me show them what's up. And so I'd come face to face with Clark 
And Clark just rinses me. He just puts me through the blender, embarrasses me, makes me look as if I haven't played soccer a day in my life. And it's just terrible. I'm so embarrassed. I'm like, I'm never playing again. This is the end. Uh, I don't even want to play soccer anymore. This sucks. And so, so quickly, I got myself to a point by understanding how good Clark was and experiencing how good Clark was, I got myself to a point where I saw, man, I'm really not all that. I'm really, I got a lot to learn. I got a lot to do. And so a couple weeks would go on. I thought I, I still thought I was invincible because I was still a freshman on varsity. So I had a little bit to, to, to speak on and brag about. But a few weeks into the season, I would finally get to start a game. Finally get to start as a freshman. And it happens to be a game against the best team in the league. And like notoriously the best team in the league. They win every single, every single year. You get to the championship game and you lose to them. That's how this team is. And so we're against this team and it's tied the entire game back and forth. Absolute dogfight on this field. They've got chances. We've got chances. There's brawls happening. Clark is doing Clark things and just mixing people up but can't score this game for whatever reason. But I got the ball in the final minutes of the game. The ball comes to me at about the halfway point of the field. And I look to my left, and there's our guy. He's Superman Curl. He could do whatever he wants. And I passed him the ball. And I just said, Clark, here, you take it. And then he passed it back to me. I was like, oh, dang it. Um, <laughs> but he passed me the ball back, and he put me in a place where I was one-on-one -on -one with their goalkeeper. I had a chance to take the glory one-on-one -on -one with the best keeper in the league. And I was looking at the goal and me and my arrogance, me and my freshman self would have just normally taken the shot. And just, you know, like the full on thing, like the once in a lifetime ball that's just sitting there and it looks just so sweet and hittable. And so I'm, I wound up for this thing. And right as I'm winding up from my left, I hear Clark and he is screaming for the ball. And he's running a full sprint to catch up with me because I was a little faster than Clark. I had that on him. But he's screaming at me for the ball. He's yelling for me to pass it to him. And I look to my left and I've got a decision. I could take the shot and go for glory or I could give it to our guy who doesn't have any defenders around him. He's wide open in space. He can do whatever he wants. He's got the Superman curl. And so I, I passed up the opportunity to go for glory myself. I passed the ball to Clark and Clark does what Clark does best. He's, he buries this opportunity. 1-0, we win the game. And it was this incredible moment that I remember so vividly of my freshman year playing soccer. It actually, I think it made me fall more in love with the game of soccer um, than anything else. But I remember the moment after the game where Clark pulled me aside and talked to me. As a freshman, he never talked to me up to this point because he was a senior, he was Clark, he could do what he wants. And he doesn't need to talk to a freshman, but he pulled me aside after the game and I'll never forget what he told me. He said, I'm so glad you passed me the ball. I'm proud of you, freshman. And it changed things for me. All of a sudden I was in love with being a part of this team. I, 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 want, I looked up to Clark, I respected Clark, I wanted to be like Clark. And friends, I think that all of us have a Captain Clark in our lives and his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And when we repent of our sins, when we run to him in his full glory, in his holiness, you know what he's saying to us? He's saying to us, I'm so glad you passed me your sin. I'm so glad you passed me the ball and I'm proud of you. We need a better priest than Nadab or Abihu. We need a better captain of our lives than ourselves. We need Jesus and Jesus only. Jesus, the one who knew no sin, went outside the camp to be consumed for other sins. And he was raised to serve as the everlasting priest for all who would trust in him. Hebrews 4 tells us, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has, who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He's able to say he's proud of us because he can empathize with our weakness. 
And in his understanding of how hard it can be for us to turn that stuff over to him, all he's asking is that we just pass him the ball, that we just give him our sin, that we turn it over to him and fully surrender to him because he is the all-consuming fire. God, through his word, is screaming to us for the ball. He is screaming for us to repent. And in many ways, like Nadab and Abihu, we have ignored God's commands. We've gone off and played with small and seemingly harmless sins and behaviors. We are the arrogant freshmen that would have just taken the shot and gone for glory. But Jesus died so that we might live. In that Romans 6 verse, the wages of sin is death. The next part of it is the good news, friends. It tells us, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we grow in our understanding of God's holiness, not only do we take our own sanctification more seriously, it becomes easier for us to pass the ball to him. It becomes easier for us to turn over our flesh to him and receive the gift of eternal life that is found in Christ and Christ alone. And it's because we understand that he is our guy that he is gonna bury the opportunity, that he is gonna put sin to death. He already has, it is in the grave and he robbed the grave. He rose to new life so that we could join him in full glory when he comes back again. And when we receive the gift of eternal life that's found in Christ, we allow for the, for the fire of the Holy Spirit within us to be set ablaze for, the, for God who is the all-consuming fire to consume our lives and consume everything around us. And that fire, friends, is ready to be set loose in your families, in your workplace, in our city, and ultimately here in our church. That's what God's design is for us, is to live in in glory and understanding that he is holy and he has a promise for us of eternal life. And we get there by understanding our relationship to him and that he is the hero of the story, that he is the all-consuming fire, that God is the one who transforms lives. And so our job is simply to pass him the ball simply pass him our sins, pass the glory on to him so that our God who is the all-consuming fire can be on the receiving end of glory. And so I end by asking you the question, what fire are you playing with that God never authorized you to play with? What sins and behaviors do you need to get out of your sense or get out of your life and give to God so that he could take it put it on the cross and bring glory to himself through our flesh, through our submission to him in authority. And so as we dive back into worship, into communion, reflect on his death on the cross and his resurrection, I want us to reflect on the things that we need to hand over to God, on the ways that we can just pass him the ball and allow for him to to bury the chance so we can sing and bring glory to him, bring him the glory that he deserves. So let's pray and we can get into worship and communion.